Welcome to the EGC Marketing Podcast. We provide you with the latest digital marketing news, performance marketing tips, and creative problem-solving skills you need to stay resilient in our fast-changing world of marketing. Listen and learn how to get the edge over your competition and grow. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EGC Marketing Edge Podcast. Our mission here is simple, to equip you with the knowledge and tactics that you need to navigate the ever-changing digital marketing landscape. I'm your host, Max, and today we have an important topic to discuss, website accessibility and ADA compliance. In this episode, we're joined by Steve Castro, EGC's Group VP of Development, who will help us navigate the complexities of website accessibility. We'll delve into what ADA compliance means, why it's crucial for your business, and practical steps to ensure that your site is accessible to all users. Whether you're a small business or a large enterprise, This episode is packed with valuable insights to help you improve your website's accessibility and also avoid potential discrimination complaints. Steve, it's great to have you with us. Thanks, Max. It's great to be here. So we'll just get right into it. Um, Can you explain what ADA compliance is and perhaps some of the implications as to what it may mean for your website or business? Sure. So really, the ADA part of it stands for the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that that has been around for almost 30 years, actually more than 30 years. Um, It was signed into law uh, in July of 1990. It's basically, at its core, it means that American citizens with disabilities are entitled to the same experience as a uh, non-disabled citizen. So it's it's a human rights act, essentially, a civil rights law. Um, So when you say ADA compliance, you're complying with that act. Um, disabilities can be defined as a lot of different things. Uh, it could be a mental disability, a physical impairment, uh, things like color blindness, uh, motor functions, hearing, behavior. Uh, it, it really covers a wide range and it really affects more than you would think. Um, and it's not just like when you see it at its core, it's it, things in everyday life. So you're looking at handicapped parking spaces. Uh, When you go in an elevator, Braille on the buttons, on hotel room door numbers, you see Braille. Um, Even when this current president uh, came to office, when they were doing the Pledge of Allegiance during his inauguration, they had someone doing sign language uh, right on the screen and speaking the the Pledge of Allegiance simultaneously, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, So it's really come to the forefront in the last few years. Uh, and the reason is because of lawsuits, which we'll, we'll get into that shortly. Um, but I did want to just uh, set the ground rules here that it's not just physical things you see in the real world, but also digital assets like websites, emails, social media, videos. Um, so the problem with that is when this act was put into place, those things were like in their infancy. Uh, most Americans did not have the internet in 1990. Uh, so there were no rules. It's just, they said it applies to these things and that's all we're going to say. It's been 30 years. They still have not said more than that. They really just, uh, about two years ago repeated that same thing. Yes, it applies to digital assets. So the web community is like, well, how do we protect ourselves? Um, so we're going to, we're going to play a little, uh, acronym party here. Uh, so the World Wide Web Consortium, with is, which is the W3C, um, that's the main group that sets the international standards for the web. Uh, so we're not talking about just America here. We're talking about globally, uh, which is an important thing to note later as we get into this. Um, they have a subgroup called the WAI, which is the Web Accessibility Initiative. And they put out a group of guidelines called WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So that's, that's enough abbreviations there, um, but WCAG is the most important thing that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, they are up to version 2.2, which just came out this past fall after being scrutinized for many months, uh, years actually, um, before it was put into place. Uh, within the WCAG, within those guidelines, there's four principles that are important to understand. Uh, perceivable operable, understandable, and robust. And within those, there's individual guidelines for things, uh, which I'll go into uh, shortly regarding like image alt text and color. Um, And then there's levels to that, A, AA, and AAA. 
Each one gets progressively harder. Uh, typically, we recommend our clients go with double A. It's right in the middle. It still gives you the opportunity to provide um, accessibility to people who need it, but uh, keep your website visually interesting and you know not so black and white. Uh, uh, it really just has to. Um, when you get to AAA, you're talking like government level websites. They see things like the DMV, uh, state sites, things like that. Well, you know, I do feel like the number one reason as to why you know you would want an ADA compliant website is your website is in fact accessible to everybody. But aside from that, are there any other, um, I guess, business benefits um, of having an ADA compliant website? You know, talking about the legal ramifications and such that you want to touch on before you really do a deep dive. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, you hit the nail right in the head. Morally, it's the right thing to do. Uh, you want things to be available to everyone. Um, but as a business owner, uh, you want to avoid potential discrimination lawsuits. It's about money. Uh, there's hefty fines involved. Large companies get sued all the time and just settle. Um, it's bad PR also, so you don't want to get that. And really, when, you know, because there's no direction from the justice department it leaves a lot of gray area so you they it's it's an opportunity for people to game the system and um it's it's kind of like a dirty secret of of ada compliance or, or accessibility lawsuits um i know firsthand of people with disabilities that license their name to a law firm that then uses it to send out like dozens of complaints at the same time using this person's name as the, um, you know, as the person on the lawsuit. Uh, and many times they're not even involved because what happens is these companies will settle. So the person whose name they're using never even gets involved. The law firm is speaking on behalf of them. They just give this guy a check and, you know, they, that's, that's their income for the year. However, that's, that's not the case all the time. So I don't want to, say that it's bad actors across the board. Uh, some of our clients have received complaints where the person actually wants to use the website and they want to work with us to fix it. Um, and again, it's going to vary wildly. You'll, you'll see as we get further into this, um, things that work for some people don't work for others. So it, you're kind of rolling the dice here, but there are some bad actors. It is a money-making machine for, for law firms. Are there any uh, websites or industries in particular that are hot targets for this? You know, my something that comes into my mind is perhaps just e-commerce because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, but you know, anything you'd like to touch on? Yes, absolutely. So e-commerce is the number one by far. Uh, so I'm going to give you some stats from our friends over at UsableNet. Um, they do some some great stuff. They they do have accessibility products, but they also offer a lot of um, content and advice uh, and also year end reports. So I'm not going to I'm not going to steal their thunder too much, but I'm going to just give you a kind of a generic overview. Uh, E-commerce is over 80% of the cases related to website accessibility in 2023. So that is by far the most. And then the rest of the top five uh, is food service, you know, like um, education, healthcare, uh, health and wellness, uh, things like that. But those are like 2%, 1%. E-commerce is number one. And the reason for that is because of COVID. Uh, so prior to COVID, uh, education and hospitality were like, and uh, healthcare were at the top. Uh, but because of COVID, everybody started ordering products online like crazy in 2020. Uh, so that just, you know, people rushed out their online stores to get them up. Uh, we were part of that. My department was putting up all kinds of notices and emergency notices uh you know e-commerce like quick so people can get what they need um when they were not able to actually physically go to the store so that really greatly increased uh the opportunity for lawsuits for e-commerce um and i did want to mention the top three states this has been the case for the last probably almost decade uh maybe even more than that but the top three states with the most cases filed annually new york california and florida Obviously, three heavy hitter states in regards to, um, you know, population and uh, cities. But uh, some of the Midwestern states and uh, states in uh, the north part of the country don't really get a lot of accessibility lawsuits. Most people don't even think of it there. Um, I've had one or two clients during the course of my 10 years here 
that have approached me that were from like a state outside of New York, California, and Florida. Interesting. And I guess just to get a bit more granular, what are the actual web issues that, you know, these people are looking to exploit? I don't want to say that it's not necessarily the nicest thing, but um, perhaps some watch outs um, in terms of like actual issues that need to be uh, observed and mitigated. Sure. So this is actually a pretty easy one. It's really a lot of common sense things. Um, image alternative text. So we call it alt text. Really, that's text uh, that describes what the image is. So if you're using a screen reader and the alt text by default gets filled in with the name of the image file, like, you know, 5678.jpg. If I'm listening on a screen reader, that makes no sense to me. I don't know what your image is. Um, so that's a very easy one that uh, they can target. They can just look at a page and right away without any development knowledge, really be able to see that that image is not described properly. And one image can set off an entire entire discrimination complaint. Uh, color contrast is another one. Uh, there are, uh, I believe, eight primary, and don't hold me to that, but eight primary uh, color blindness types. Uh, and then there's like subtypes of those. And it affects a tremendous amount of American citizens and, and globally, obviously, too. Um, so things like uh, where you have your type on top of an image, like in a in a header banner, um, it, it's you know if you can't read it on top of that, it it doesn't help the person be able to understand your page, and it's a lot more tricky than you think because something visually to me, as someone without a color contrast disability, um, I might be able to see it fine, but the person with it uh, with the disability cannot. Um, and it's, there's tools that we use to test because sometimes our perception of it is not accurate to what the other people are seeing. Um, tab focus for people with motor disabilities uh, that maybe can't use um, a mouse to navigate a site if they're using some other motor control, um, you know, if they're in a chair or, you know, they have they, people use breathing, breathing tubes to be able to like puff into it to navigate a site, uh, things like that, like tabbing through a site meaning moving between focusable elements is critical. It has to go in the right order and you can't trap the person's uh, keyboard in that spot essentially. So if you have a, an overlay that pops up and you can't dismiss the overlay easily, that's a keyboard trap. Um, web forms, especially forms with, that are for financial transactions. Uh, screen reader issues, which we've touched upon a little bit, uh, basically um, not being able to read things in the right order. Uh, having it read your navigation over and over and over every page the person goes to. Uh, we have to put in uh, skip features so they can bypass that navigation. Um, I, I strongly encourage, if you're ever diving into accessibility, to turn on your computer's screen reader. Uh, most computers have one built in, but there's also browser tools you can use. And just listen to a site just to see how aggravating it is for someone that has to use a screen reader. Um, it's really like, it's a very widespread problem on the web. Um, I did want to touch on the newest round of guidelines that came out in the fall, also added rules for visual focus. Um, so being able to see something that is focused on the screen, you know, typically it's a glow or, you know, changes color, uh, underlines for links. Uh, they added rules for touch gestures. So, you know, now that we have mobile devices and tablets, uh, minimum tap area. So there's a uh, guidelines that Apple has for iOS devices that have been adopted uh, pretty similar. I believe it's the same size within a couple of pixels for minimum tap area uh, for these WCAG uh, rules. And then um, I did want to point out, this is important because it often gets overlooked. This applies to all digital assets. So that includes PDF files, uh, videos, email, social a lot of people overlook PDF files. Uh, they just upload something. It's a flat image. It can't be read if it's a flat image. Uh, so the same rules apply, uh, you know, to those assets. And getting them to reach the success criteria is very tricky, especially for videos. Let's walk through a hypo or a hypothetical, if you will. So a company receives a discrimination complaint. What are the next steps that they should do immediately? And also, how can these companies really continue to make their sites compliant and avoid situations like this going forward? Okay, so number one, find professional help. Uh, that could be us. 
agency developers, um, and also a law firm that specializes in accessibility. Uh, we're lucky to have one local to us here, uh, not too far from our office, that just by the, the magic of chance uh, happened to hook up with us a couple of years ago. But there's a list of top 10, uh, both on the plaintiff and defendant side of accessibility uh, that I, I mentioned earlier, uh, UsableNet, in their year-end report, they list a top 10 on both sides. Um, so you can reach out to one of, you know, to obviously you're going to be a defendant in that case. So um, you would want to reach out to one of them. Um, you can ask me personally, if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, um, I can point you in the right direction. I know some people, uh, you know, that we trust in that, in that regard, uh, but definitely find help because you're not going to be able to fix it on your own. Um, once you get that help, you're going to want to determine if you should fight it or settle it. So most large companies will just settle it. Uh, Apple, Pizza Hut, Nike, uh, these companies get sued annually uh, multiple times. Uh, it's like a drop in the bucket to them. Uh, it, it's impossible to, to be able to fend off every uh, complaint that comes your way. So they'll settle it. But if you're a small company, uh, for example, I had one uh, in the Pacific Northwest. They're an adventure, adventure destination hotel. So they're up in the mountains. Now, they have issues with physical um, ADA compliance, meaning their building has to be accessible. But they also got a website complaint, and the guy was telling me, well, we're an adventure company. These people hike up mountains you know, with gear. Why does my company have to cater to someone in a wheelchair? Um, logically, he's not far off, but it applies to all Americans. So you have to, um, it's difficult for people who specialize in those industries to be able to accommodate that. Um, so there's a couple of ways you can go about this. Occasionally you'll get a grace period to, to fix the issues. Um, if you, that's, if you get a list of what the issues are, um, we have seen, uh, especially in the last two years, some of our clients have just received a blanket uh, complaint, which you can tell was sent out. We actually tracked one down. We went out to 60 different education institutions. There was no actual specifics of what was wrong, just said, I can't use your website. Um, but if you do actually kind of fight it gently, we'll say, um, and poke a little bit and say, hey, can you tell me what's wrong here? Um, often you'll get the opportunity to be able to fix the issues within a certain amount of time. You might still have to settle a certain amount, um, but you want to demonstrate that you can actually, that you're taking it seriously. Um, so step one is conducting an accessibility audit. Um, you can do that with free tools, but it's not going to be that comprehensive. Uh, like I said, it's best to reach out to an expert such as EGC group. Um, and then you're going to want to make an action plan to remediate the issues. So what we do, we offer um, a couple of different services in this regard. Uh, so we will either consult uh, we will do the audit and fix the issues, or we will do the audit and then do a briefing with uh, the company's, you know, personal development team. Um, you know, if they have somebody in place, maybe they're they're just, you know, a, a front end developer. They don't really have much back end experience. They're going to need a walkthrough. Uh, so we we do comprehensive reports. Um, and again, these free tools are only going to scan what they see on the surface. They're not going to give you what you need because when we test it's about 60 to 70 percent automated test and interpreting what that means and then like another 30 30 40 percent of actual physical testing tabbing through the pages uh, a machine a computer automated test is not going to be able to know if the description on an image makes sense in context with the image it's just going to look to see that there's something there um, so it really requires a human touch there. So don't, don't fall for some of these things that we're going to talk about in a little bit in regards to services that offer, um, you really, you have to understand it in order to fix it. Um, and again, even if you decide to settle, fix the issues because they can sue you for the same thing over and over and over. There is no limit to it. So you will get sued. We've seen, uh, one of our clients in the past get sued twice by the same person for the same thing because they chose not to take action for budget reasons. And it is more cost-effective to fix the issue than to get sued over and over. 
Gotcha. So we touched on a lot there, which is great. Um, but I guess the next question is, is there anything that companies should completely stay away from not do in particular that you want to address, you know, right now? Uh, so to what they should not do um, is don't use ADA widgets. Uh, those, it's, it's like a Band-Aid. Uh, essentially, when you are a disabled user, uh, they are using their own assistive technology already. They don't need your little widget. Uh, they have their own stuff already installed on their devices and their browsers. The fixes that these widgets put in place, they're not reliable. So I just mentioned image alt text. Um, they will use, I guess it's an AI of some sort, probably like a very low level one, to guess what the image is. And we've seen it happen where, oh, yes, it has alt text, but it makes absolutely no sense. Sometimes it's completely wrong and could be damaging to the company if it says the wrong thing. Um, and also, the widget does not guarantee that you're not going to get sued. 20% uh, of cases in 2023 still involve sites that were utilizing the widget. So it makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, we often get clients asking us, can we just put this on? I tell them you can, but it, it causes its own problems. Um, it sometimes creates more uh, than you would expect. Um, and then, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, watch out for companies that try to sell you on these services where it's like a script that fixes your site on the fly as it loads. Um, that doesn't really fix the issues. The issues are still there. It's just masking them. Um, and also those scripts don't work if the person has JavaScript turned off on their machine. A lot of disabled users have very stripped down browsers where a lot of those scripts, script functionality is turned off. Um, so we've been, we've been pitched on that in the past from various vendors. We always decline it. I prefer to actually f build the site to be compliant or fix the issues uh, that exist. Gotcha. So it definitely seems like the ADA monitoring is an ongoing and human, you know, importantly process. It requires oversight. You can't rely on all these technologies that say they're going to fix everything. Um, do you just want to give any closing thoughts in that regard, um, just in terms of, you know, the maintenance and, uh, you know, the importance of such before we before I give you my, my final question? Sure, sure. I guess a mystery question. We'll see. Uh, very exciting. Um, so we recommend doing uh, accessibility and audit every three to six months. So like I said, this is accessibility is ongoing. Um, if you have a lot of people that touch your site, uh, like editors, content editors, uh, bloggers, developers, creatives, uh, they need to be trained to know what to look for. Like developers can only fix and automate so much in accessibility. But the content that goes in and get, that gets edited daily needs to be checked periodically. So we typically say every six months, if you're a real, real heavy target, uh, like let's say you're in New York and you're, you have an e-commerce store, um, you know, then you would want to maybe check it every three months. Theoretically, if you're doing it correctly, it will, your effort there will diminish over time because you'll have fixed the issues. Uh, I mentioned training. Uh, you're going to want to establish an accessibility policy page on your site that just mentions that you are aware of accessibility. You take it seriously. These are the WCAG rules that you're complying with. Um, give them an opportunity to contact you to be able to reach out and work with you to fix the issue before they decide to sue you. Um, so, and, you know, keep it updated, update the date on that page. Um, you know, those are small things you could do if you don't have a big budget like like i said these small businesses uh they, they don't have a lot to work with so you you know there are steps you can take but very critical and this will be my closing thought um you can never be totally compliant and there's a reason for that number one there's no individual guidelines from the government so you're not technically compliant with anything um until they decide to put out rules you're using the rules that the web community put out to police themselves. Um, there is no actual certification to make you like bulletproof in this regard. Um, all the complaints and judgments for these cases are based on someone's opinion on if you're demonstrating that you're aware and active in keeping your site compliant. So one, one person that's judging your case may say your company takes accessibility seriously. I could see there's intent here and you're taking steps, maybe it's not perfect. So we're not gonna hit you over the head with a giant settlement, but you know, at least I could see that you guys are trying. Maybe they'll give you the chance to fix it before making it you know, 
uh, making you have to settle for a gigantic amount. Um, and then even, you know, for developers, even like the methods to achieve success within the criteria of WCAG, it's debatable. Uh, like they have like, you know, checkpoints of what you can do, but the ways to get to that point can vary depending on who's building it, what their opinion is. Does it work with this person's uh, setup for, you know, their own personal machine? Like they might be using JAWS for a screen reader and someone else might be using their built-in Apple screen reader. And those two softwares vary. So what works for one person doesn't work for the other. So you have to be fluid and flexible and work with people. Uh, if you have the budget, test with a real disabled user. Um, we often don't get to do that because of budget reasons, but that's really the, the most solid way you can uh, get your site compliant. Gotcha. And then the last question I ask to all of our guests, is there anything going on in your field of expertise that excites you that you would like to share with our listeners or viewers? Uh, sure. So this is actually like a, a passion for me. Um, you know, I actually prefer accessibility, um, like scanning and thought and strategy over development. Um, it's not, this is not going away. So when something new comes out, uh, it really does excite me. Um, like I said, the new set of rules that came out in the fall were being debated by, by uh, the WAI and uh, the W3C, all the, all the acronyms we mentioned earlier. That was being debated for years. Um, and 3.0 is not too far down the road. Uh, so that'll be a big change for us. But what would be the most exciting thing coming up is if the Justice Department in the United States actually puts out their own guidelines so we have something concrete to be able to say, yes, I'm compliant. Here's my certification. That would solve so many problems. But it would also be a money loss for all the people that make money in this industry. Gotcha. We'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed for that to happen. Steve, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, everyone, if you found this valuable, please feel free to like, share, subscribe, um, and we will see you in our next episode.